and welcome to session 16 of our vision and commitment course. In this session, we're going to look at the roles of elders and deacons. Having looked at Ephesians 4 ministries, which often function beyond the local church, we're now going to bring it all home and we're going to look at what the Bible has to say about local church leadership. You know, many of us have become accustomed to being led from the pulpit these days. And we are the self-help generation. If people want information, if they want to understand something, if they want to know something, if they want to learn, they will typically just either buy a book or go online and get a teaching. And this is how we've become used to actually growing. Now, as much as it is wonderful and important to be those who can self-feed, I think that very often we miss the extent to which the early church was a fathering discipleship type of hands-on maturing environment. And because of that, some people are probably going to find the teaching in this session to be quite unfamiliar. So that said, let's get into the notes together. Hebrews 13 verses 7 and 17 read like this. Remember your leaders, those who spoke to you the word of God. Consider the outcome of their way of life and imitate their faith. Obey your leaders and submit to them, for they are keeping watch over your souls as those who will have to give an account. Let them do this with joy and not with groaning, for that would be of no advantage to you. You will have heard me mention a number of times during this course um, a particular guy, a guy called Mike, who uh, I had the privilege of being cared for and discipled under. He was, a, he was very much a father figure to me um, in my first years of really serving the Lord. And even though um, that relationship had many challenges, particularly in the early days, um, I am still to this day so grateful that God supplied somebody into my life to speak the truth in love, somebody who would know the word so much better than I did, somebody who would have maturity, wisdom, and boldness to speak the truth to me. Um, you know, it's interesting because I think as I look back now at the miracle of that relationship, and I, I don't know how much of it was the miracle of finding somebody who was willing to do that, so much as the miracle of God working on my heart to be responsive to somebody who would speak those truths. And, um, and I was just thinking back to one of the first major interactions that I had with Mike. And, and what had happened was um, I'd just um, gotten my life sorted out with God and I was going along to this new church with my brother Howard. And Howard and I were kind of very much yoked together in those early days and still are today for that matter. But uh, uh, we were there in this church. And uh, now Howard is a very close friend and brother to me. And he's the, the type of, it's the type of friendship that we could just look at each other and know what we're thinking. And you know, that can be dangerous because it means that if something is funny, all I've got to do is catch his eye and we're both laughing at the same thing. Now, I remember at one particular Sunday morning, we were both in this meeting and the person who was speaking made a comment that Howard and I both found really funny. And I glanced across at him and he at me and I started chuckling. Now, the trouble is, is when I start laughing and I'm trying to suppress it, everything's okay apart from my shoulders. <laughs> so my shoulders are doing this thing and I just can't stop it and um, the guy who discipled me this guy called Mike he had a beard and I remember when he was kind of not happy with you it's like his beard would come out point at you and you knew you were in trouble you know and um, so anyway I'm chuckling away and I look across at Mike and the beard sticks out and I'm like oh no so I'm thinking okay when I see him next time I get together with him I'm going to preempt the whole situation I thought I'm going to go in there and I'm going to say straight away before he rebukes me I'm going to say straight away oh sorry about what happened on Sunday night with the laughing and so anyway so I did I got to he, he was an upholsterer and I used to go and sit in his shed while he was upholstering chairs and he'd have a mouthful of nails and taking these tacks and stuff like that and he'd be talking to me through the nails you know and 
And so I said, hey, Mike, uh, sorry about Sunday. I hope it wasn't too distracting for the speaker, you know, but... Uh, you know, I, I just ended up getting, something was funny, it just kind of tickled me and Howard and I started laughing and uh, just wanted to apologize for that. And he said, he said, oh, that's all right, John. He said, you know, sometimes you find this dynamic with young girls, you know, they'll just, uh, they'll start giggling and they just can't get over a little giggling fit. <laughs> now you gotta understand something here, guys. I, I was sort of nearly 20 at this point. And I wasn't a kind of normal 20 year old. I'd left home from being 16, you know, I'd been working, I was considered myself a man's man. And I'm like, this guy is calling me a girl. He's calling me a little giggly girl. And I remember at this point, it was actually quite crucial because something in me rose up to want to give him an earful of what I thought. I wanted to somehow react in the flesh at that point. But you know what? A scripture that I'd read earlier that week kept on coming to me, and it was uh, Proverbs 12, 1, which says, whoever loves discipline loves knowledge, but he who hates correction is stupid. I remember being quite impacted by the fact that the Bible would call somebody stupid, but I loved its straight speaking, honest challenge to, hey, if you hate correction, Bottom line, you're stupid. Yeah. And so I swallowed my pride at that point and I continued to listen to him. You know what? It dealt with that giggliness in me in meetings. There was something about what he addressed at that moment that brought about change in me. We have seen how essential the Ephesians 4 ministries are as they lead and serve in the body of Christ. In this session, we will look at those who are called by God to particular positions of leadership and service in the local congregation. Our society increasingly bulks against authority in all its forms and does not think of servanthood as something virtuous. We may therefore need to adjust our thinking as we approach this subject, and we would do well to start by focusing on the ultimate model of leadership and servanthood. Christ, the servant leader. Isaiah 9, 6 says, For unto us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder. Ephesians 5.23 says, Christ is the head of the church, his body, and is himself its saviour. Jesus came not only to be our saviour, but also to be our Lord and to exercise a real rule in our lives. However, though it might seem like a contradiction, he also came to serve. Matthew 20, 28 says, the son of man came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. The church is built on Jesus, the foundation and chief cornerstone and should reflect him in every way. His nature should especially be seen in those holding positions of responsibility in the local church. Later in this session, we will look at how servanthood is exemplified by deacons, but first we will look at those who lead the congregation. Now, before I go into this next section, I just wanna say something to you. We should be able to recognize Christ in leadership. Wherever you are, whatever church situation you are in, you should be able to recognize Christ-like qualities in the leadership that is over your life. Is that your experience? Is that your experience? If it's not, you are most foolish to stay in a situation that consistently fails in this. I just wanna get something across here because very often people feel bound within church situations that they have not experienced anything that resembles Christ-like care in their life. And sometimes they find themselves controlled by personalities, 
controlled by expectations, controlled by a nature that has been bound and restricted. And I just want to say to you, the way of Christ is one of liberty and freedom. The way of Christ is wisdom and guidance. Now, please don't mishear me in this. I'm not saying if a leader has had the courage to correct you on an issue, you should leave and say, that's not like Christ. Wrong. That's just like Christ. So I'm not talking about the challenge of somebody encouraging you to lead a godly life. I'm not talking about running as soon as something has been addressed in your life. I'm not speaking about that at all. What I'm speaking about is some of the horrendous situations which I've come across over the years where people are serving under leaders that are controlling, leaders that are actually restrictive and binding in people's lives, leaders that are all about themselves and not about serving and caring for the flock. And I look at those situations and I say, people need to have the liberty to step out of those situations and find leadership that will actually reflect Christ's loving care in their life. And so leadership in the local church, as already noted in this course, there is much confusion in the church today when it comes to leadership roles and titles. We saw in the last session that even the familiar term pastor is not actually used in the New Testament to refer to those who lead the local congregation. That responsibility is given to elders, also called overseers. However, elder is yet another term that has often been misunderstood and misapplied. Many churches have elders who just operate as a board, elected by the congregation to serve a term of office, during which they meet occasionally to make administrative decisions. In many cases, they have little or no involvement in actual leading, teaching, and caring for the flock. They leave that to the pastor, the professional whom they, as one of their administrative decisions, will hire to handle the spiritual aspects of the life of the church and whom they will fire if the job isn't done the way they like it. Is there any wonder that the church is so often in a mess when you consider this structure and how non-biblical it is in every way? Now listen, even as we begin talking about the term elder, I am so conscious that you can be hearing me use the term elder and translating it into a context which is very different than the biblical context that I'm about to describe. You know, if you ever talk with somebody and you use a word that you're using in common and afterwards you realize, okay, we were talking about completely different things because what that word meant to them was completely different than what that word means to me. And so what is gonna happen here is I'm going to try and unpack from the Bible what an elder actually is, and then let our understanding and definition of the word be consistent with the Bible. So the leadership of the local church as described in the New Testament was by a plurality of elders who were deeply involved in the practical and spiritual care of the people. However, before examining what scripture shows us about church eldership, let's look at elders in Israel prior to the birthing of the church. So elders in scripture. Elders are mentioned throughout the Old Testament. The term quite literally referred to aged or older men, but came to be used beyond that to refer specifically to those recognized as wise, experienced, and of proven character, and who were therefore looked to as leaders in, firstly, the family or tribe. And we see that in Deuteronomy 5.23, but also, secondly, in civil government. So the elders were not just involved in home life, family life, but elders were involved in a local level, local uh, political level. And, uh, and then finally, uh, in religious life, and there's countless references connected to that. The one thing I want you to understand is that elders were always involved in all of life. So elders were not just given to a single sphere where people could say, hey, that's your business 
and the rest of it is not your business. Now, elders were always involved in every sphere of life. That's an important point as we move on to New Testament elders. In the New Testament, it is clear from the Gospels and Acts that elders still had a similar status and role in the life of the Jewish community. The Greek word translated as elder is presbyteros, which, like its Old Testament counterpart, conveyed the concept of maturity and character. It is therefore not surprising that this term was adopted by the newly birthed community of Christians to refer to its leaders. And so elders as overseers. As mentioned above, the other term used in the New Testament for church leaders is overseers. This translates the Greek word episkopos, a compound of epi, meaning over, and scopus, meaning to look, watch, peer about, oversee. The word bishop is derived from episcopus. The piscop became bishop. That's how the word came about. And in many denominations has come to refer to a hierarchical regional position. However, in the New Testament, episcopus is interchangeable with presbyterus as a term for the leaders of the local congregation. For example, in Acts 20, 17, we read that Paul sent to Ephesus for the elders, presbyterus, of the church, whom he then addresses in verse 28 as overseers, episcopus. One could say that elder emphasizes who the person is and overseer what the person does. Okay, so we've covered a lot there, but I just want to say that this concept of the church having a hierarchy of bishops, which many of us may be familiar with in our history or may be currently the situation you're in, um, is an unbiblical structure. That's not how the word originated or should be used. Now, we might be familiar with terms like vicar, reverend, cardinal, priest, or even pastor, but these are not terms used for leadership in the New Testament. These are all things that have developed through church history, coming very often from questionable origin. And so we want to come back to what does the Bible say about eldership? Qualifications for eldership. Much of the church today would consider the necessary qualifications for leadership to come in the form of certificates from seminaries or other academic institutions. This is not what we see in the New Testament. Just want to stop here for a moment. I think it's incredibly interesting that uh, the career-based approach to becoming a leader in the church through education is once again a way in which the church has conformed to the pattern of this world. You see, it's the pattern of this world that you go and you train and you become educated and then you're launched into a career. This is nothing to do with God's intention for leadership in the church. Now you say, are you against people going to seminaries? Are you against people being educated um, in the scriptures and in theology? Absolutely not. I'm totally for it, if that's right in the calling of their lives. But I want you to understand that a three-year degree does not make you a leader. A certificate does not give you gifting to be able to care for people's lives. And it is tragic how many young men and women are thrust into the care of people's lives with nothing but education. Now, I thank God for his wisdom in the word that shows us that God looks for something actually quite different when it comes to the caring of his sheep. Following are the two passages of scripture that set out most deliberately and clearly the qualifications for an overseer or elder. You're going to notice as I read out the passages of scripture that there will be um, explanations um, that are given in parentheses. Um, these explanations are just the most accurate direct translations from Greek to help us kind of understand uh, the message that is being communicated about the particular word that's used. And so 
Turning then to 1 Timothy chapter 3, verses 2 to 7, we read this. Therefore, an overseer must be above reproach, the husband of one wife, sober-minded, i.e. clear-headed, thoughtful, um, self-controlled, respectable, hospitable, able to teach, not a drunkard, not violent, but gentle, not quarrelsome, literally peaceable, not a lover of money, literally not covetous. He must manage his own household well, with all dignity, keeping his children submissive. For if someone does not know how to manage his own household, how will he care for God's church? He must not be a recent convert, literally a novice, or he may become puffed up with conceit and fall into the condemnation of the devil. Moreover, he must be well thought of by outsiders so that he may not fall into disgrace, into a snare of the devil. And then you're going to find very similarly the other passage that lists the uh, so-called qualifications of an elder is Titus chapter 1 verse 5b to 9. It reads this, appoint elders in every town as I directed you. If anyone is above reproach, the husband of one wife and his children are believers, literally are faithful, and not open to the charge of debauchery or insubordination. For an overseer, as God's steward, must be above reproach. He must not be arrogant, not self-willed, or quick-tempered, or a drunkard, or violent, or greedy for gain, but hospitable, a lover of good, self-controlled, upright, holy, and disciplined. He must hold firm to the trustworthy word as taught, so that he may be able to give instruction in sound doctrine and also to rebuke those who contradict it. Now, I don't know what you feel when you hear or read this list, but I remember the first time that I read this list being impacted by what a low bar it seemed to be. You know, it seemed to me like it's saying like, you know, if the guy's not a violent drunk who loves money and has multiple wives, he's worthy of consideration. I kind of look at it and think, this doesn't seem like a particularly high bar in many ways. But I want you to understand that in reality, these qualifications are really more examples of things that would be disqualifications for somebody considering eldership. Okay, so it's not a high bar. I believe it's purposefully set that many might aspire and desire eldership and reach for this noble task is what the scripture says. But these are things that we would take most seriously when considering somebody for eldership. These requirements relate to character, capability, and confirmation. Let's look first at character. God is not looking for executives to run a business, but for mature men of integrity who will care for and lead his family. So it's not surprising that character takes prominence over gifting when appointing elders. The overriding requirement is that the elder be above reproach. And in the above passages, Paul gives specific examples of this requirement. So again, it's, it's really important that we understand that God is looking for those who will care for his children. You know, somewhat recently, a young man became interested in one of my daughters. And um, I had the opportunity to get to know this young man quite well. And I would ask him, as you can imagine, many searching questions. Do you know the one thing I didn't ask him about at all was his gifts, about his gifts and abilities. I wasn't in the least bit interested in how good a communicator he was. I wasn't in the least bit interested in how influential he was. What I wanted to know is, would he be a man of humility? 
Would he be a man who would be faithful? Was he a man of character? You know why? Because I was going to entrust my daughter into his hands for the rest of her life. At that point, what I was after was character. How much more is God like that, do you think, when it comes to who he wants caring for his children? He's after character. You know what a tragedy today is if somebody is gifted enough, the church is incredibly willing to overlook the most extreme weakness of character. It's almost like if you can communicate well enough, that's all that we really want. If you can wow us with a sermon, if you can mesmerize us with your gift as an orator, if you can whip us up with your ability to communicate, we'll just overlook the fact that your family is in a complete shambles, that your life is falling apart, you're in an absolute mess, but hey, he can preach. This is serious. Because so often churches are not looking for men of character. They're looking for great showmen. That's what they're looking for, great showmen. Because great showmen will gather crowds. They'll draw people and they'll give that outward appearance of success. God is not fooled. God is not fooled. And I tell you, as fast as those things can grow, they'll fall apart. Because they're not built on character. God's after character. Okay, so following character, one might ask the question, well, does it matter that they're capable at all? If we're just looking at men of great character and, and solid background, does it really matter that they have any ability? And the answer would be yes. Capability does play a part. Though good character is essential, elders must be able to fulfill certain responsibilities. The areas of ability listed by Paul can be summarized as follows. Sound doctrine. An elder must hold firm to sound doctrine and encourage others to do so, rebuking those who contradict it. This requires him to be skilled in correctly handling scripture. Okay, so um, Paul says at one point to Timothy, he says, the things you've heard me say in the presence of many witnesses entrust to reliable men who will be able to teach others. There was an understanding in his appointing of leadership that there would be this ability to impart things that have been learned. And also to say this, Paul also commended the church for passing on the teachings just as they had received it. Can I just say this? Paul was passionate that people would not be independently self-expressive, but that they would be faithful in communicating accurately truths. And I'm telling you something, brothers and sisters, in our culture, that issue in itself is greatly challenged these days because people don't like the idea of passing things on that have been learned in the way that it was taught to them with the depth of what they've understood, what they want to always do is recreate it in a way that expresses their personality. Now, listen, guys, I'm not saying that we should be personality less. And I'm not saying that we shouldn't be creative. But can I just say this? The truths of scripture are more important than your creative expression. And where your creative expression obfuscates the truth, then it's an error. It's a problem. It's an issue that actually robs people of revelation. So sometimes I hear the reinvention, the recommunication of a truth. And I think that's actually not what the Bible says. Yeah, it's fun. It's creative. It's entertaining but it's not actually what the Bible says. Now listen, there's something of the reliability and commitment to truth that elders must embody. They are to represent the apostolic heart to the people. They're to represent the apostolic heart and therefore they have to get to grips with the apostolic foundation that the church is to be devoted to. This is really important. 
communication. An elder must be able to teach others, encouraging, comforting, instructing, training, correcting, and rebuking. Okay, that's part of the job. They've got to be able to do all of those things. They're not necessarily everybody's best buddy. Why? Because they have a job to do, which includes correcting. It includes instructing. It includes rebuking. This is part of the role of an elder. And you might think an elder's doing a great job because you just always feel warm and cuddly when you see him. But that's not necessarily because they're doing a great job. Sometimes it's because they're not doing their job of speaking the truth in love to you. Now listen, an elder needs to be gifted to communicate these things, otherwise he shouldn't be an elder. Of course, this is not to say that within their communication that an elder must be able to teach in the sense of Ephesians 4 teacher, but it's just that they must have the sufficient ability to accomplish the task. It's that level of teaching they would need to have. The next is leadership itself. An elder must be able to lead, having demonstrated this in how he manages his own household. He must not be a novice, but should have a history of faithfulness in what has been entrusted to him. Guys, listen, if nobody's following you, you're not a leader. Just to be clear, the, the most basic understanding of leadership is that people are following you. If nobody's following you, you're not leading anybody. And let me just say this, if your family is not following you, that is the biggest indication that you're not a leader. Now that might be hard for some people to swallow, but this is the straight speaking God of the Bible on the subject. He's saying, listen, if, you're, if your children are in disarray, if they're rebellious, if they're in debauchery, you know, if your wife doesn't listen to you, if you have no sense of rule within your home, how do you think you're going to rule the people of God? Well, I'm a great teacher. I'm a great orator. You know, these disqualifications would say, it doesn't matter how good a communicator you are, something about your life does not cause leadership to flow from you. People don't follow you. And so confirmation... Elders should have a good reputation and be respected both within the congregation and in the wider local community. It's important that we understand that consistent, recognized integrity is to work through the whole of life. So this is not somebody who can just make a good presentation on a Sunday morning. This is somebody who, if you could go to anybody in the workplace and ask them about him, their comment would be, oh yeah, he, he's one of our best workers. Bill, you're talking about Bill? Yeah, totally reliable. We love Bill. I would, if I had a hundred Bills, I could take this company through the roof. You know, everyone else might let me down, but Bill's faithful. Yeah, Bill, Bill doesn't gossip. If people are speaking negatively, Bill will just close it down. I know that Bill's got my back. And you know what? Bill's also got an ear for me. Bill's not too busy to hear me. You see, that's what we would look for when considering an elder. And if in the wider sphere of their life, that's not the testimony we got. We got, well, yeah, I know Bill's a good guy, but boy, you should see him when he loses his temper. I mean, there's tools flying. There's every profanity you've ever heard coming out of his mouth. I know he's a Christian. I know he goes to church on Sunday. I know he's one of those holy roller coasters. But in reality, what we see in the workplace does not measure up with that. See, this is what the scripture is saying to look at. What's his reputation outside like? See, because God's looking for consistent integrity in his leaders. All right, so let's look at the appointment of elders. How does it happen? In 1 Timothy 3.1, we read that if anyone aspires to the office of overseer, he desires a noble task. 
However, elders are not self-appointed on the basis of their own sense of call, nor are they democratically elected on the basis of their popularity. Scripture shows us that there is a process by which a man comes to this position. Just to say something about this issue of aspiring to and desiring, I'm not sure that this text is saying that only those that do have this aspiration to lead and desire to lead should be considered. But I do believe it's saying that if they don't consider this to be an honor that they would willingly give themselves to, they, they shouldn't take it on. I know that many of the men that I have had the privilege of serving under and with in eldership over the years have not been guys who actually aspired to eldership. I know that many of them were somewhat shocked in fact, honestly, that was the case with me. I remember having a conversation with a guy called Bryn Jones who was apostolic over t our churches at the time. I remember going on a walk with him and I was 28, I believe, at the time. And as we walked along and I shared with him my views and thoughts about the church and things that I felt were needed, um, he just listened and asked questions and backwards and forwards it went. And at a certain point he said, are you desirous of the role of elder? And first of all, I was confused because I didn't understand actually what he meant. You know, desirous of the role of, I, I just like, what does he mean by that? And then secondly, I thought, I think he thinks I'm really old. I'm a young man. I have no gray hair. Why would he ask me such a thing? You see, because in my mind, eldership was something that happened in your late 50s or 60s maybe. And so I thought the whole thing was weird at that point that he was asking me. And to be honest with you, at the time, I remember thinking, I don't know that it would make any difference. I'd still am going to do what I'm going to do. I'm still going to care for people and serve. But I remember saying to him, if, if, you, if you think it would be helpful, if you think it's a good idea, I'm, I'm willing for it. But it was not something that I was actually going for. And I remember making that statement that, Okay, but I don't think it will make any difference. And I remember him just sort of smirking to himself, you know, that kind of like, you naive young thing type thing, you don't get what it's gonna mean. And the truth is I didn't at that moment understand what weight would fall on me when eldership did actually come upon me. I didn't understand that. I just thought, well, I guess I'm just more official doing what I'm doing. But there was something very different when that responsibility first began to rest on me and I realized that hey I have to give an account for everything that's going on here now there's nothing that's going on that I don't have some responsibility for and it changed it changed a lot of things I'll talk a bit about this as we go along okay so coming back to the process of somebody becoming an elder first of all the Holy Spirit anoints in Acts 20, 28a, we read this. Pay careful attention to yourselves and to all the flock in which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers. It's the Holy Spirit that made you an overseer. When looking at Ephesians 4 ministries, we saw that it is God who appoints those who are to serve him in key roles and that Christ gives these gifts to the church. It is not surprising then that God plays the primary role in raising up leaders in the local congregation. And so the Holy Spirit anoints. Next, the apostle appoints. In Acts 14, 23, we read this, Paul and Barnabas appointed elders for them in each church and with prayer and fasting committed them to the Lord in whom they had put their trust. The appointment to eldership will be by or at the direction of the apostle who serves that church. His apostolic vision enables him to see the hand of God on the emerging elder. His shepherding engagement with the local church enables him to hear the heart of the people. These are aspects of his anointing as a wise master builder. 
Now, let me just say something about these dual giftings here that we see in the apostle functioning to the church. What we're saying is that God will give the apostle an insight into, if you like, the embryonic gifting of eldership emerging in people. He'll have an eye to see through their level of maturity right now to a level of maturity they will come into. And he'll be able to foster and encourage that. That's an insight he has into the structure of the growing house. But here's the other thing, his shepherding heart towards the people will have a sense of where the people are at in their responsiveness to the apostle. And therefore somebody will not be thrust upon them that they have no sense of confidence that this person will be able to care for us in this way. How many of you realize this requires a great deal of hands-on involvement by the apostle? Now, I believe that Paul was such an apostle to be involved with the church, to know that which structurally was needed in the development of the church. And we read in Titus chapter 1, verse 5, we read, The reason I left you in Crete was that you might straighten out what was left unfinished and appoint elders in every town as I directed you. So this is just not a random commission. This is direction that Paul gave to Titus. Why? Because Paul knew the churches to which Titus was going to be involved with. Incidentally, the biblical pattern shows that elders continue in relationship with and remain accountable to the apostle. One cannot have a biblical eldership without biblical apostleship. You know, there is a trend in the church today that is moving away from the one-man pastor model into a plurality of elders. But it is shocking how many churches are just absolutely dismissing the fact that it is a New Testament type apostle that actually appointed the elders. And without that apostolic involvement, eldership just becomes a smaller democracy. It just becomes a board of professionals very often. It just becomes executives. Or it becomes those that carry some degree of pastoral care, but there will be much confusion when they hit difficulties. And so what will happen is they will inevitably fall back to a previous model, which will be a senior pastor and associate pastors. You can call it what you want, but it can just be semantics if there is an authentic apostolic involvement within it. So we don't get to bypass or leapfrog over apostles and get to elders. It just doesn't work. The importance of plurality. It is important to note that in both the Old and New Testaments, eldership is always, always a plural concept. Nowhere in the New Testament do we find a sole elder placed over a church. Okay, just want to stop there. When you think about this for a second, nowhere in the scripture do we see a sole elder. Now, I want you to understand, I am so clear on this, that I will not set in a sole elder into a church. Even if there is one that is emerging clearly as an elder, I will always wait until there is at least one other emerging as an elder also before setting them into eldership in the church. I remember for many years, uh, Tim, Uh, the first elder of the church in uh, Living Light in Kenosha served as a sole elder. And I remember that when I was set into eldership with him, when myself and another brother called Don were set into eldership together with Tim, I remember Tim getting up and saying, "Uh, today is not a stage of development. Today, a wrong has been made right. A wrong has been made right. I think that it's that same conviction that's in my heart that says I will not make that mistake with setting in a sole elder. Now, sometimes somebody becomes a sole elder because one of the other elders dies. 
So if you've got a church with two elders and one dies, what I would say is this, for me, apostolically, my first task will be to join that elder and serve alongside him until we can raise up other elders. Such is my conviction on this issue. On one level, this just seems like common sense. No one man is gifted or strong enough to be able to adequately care for and minister to an entire congregation on an ongoing basis. We have already considered the adverse consequences for all concerned when someone tries. Remember, we looked last week at pastors and the ridiculous expectation that is often put on those that are placed into that ministry. However, God's heart for plurality in leadership is more than just a practical concern. An essential characteristic of God is his triunity. He himself is plurality manifesting in oneness. His intent is to be reflected on the earth by a church which is one, though comprised of many. The church will be brought to this state as it is equipped by Ephesians 4 ministries working together in unity. On a local congregational level, it is matured and shaped by the example and care of a team of elders working together as one. So guys, what we're saying here is that this is not just about, oh, the poor soul elder, how will he manage? No, this is about something God has intended to express of who he is through the miracle of men working together in unity. It's through a miracle that God wants to demonstrate something to the earth. And you know, many will say, this can't work. Over the years, I have known many say to me, the concept of plurality and equality of eldership just doesn't work. I know naturally speaking it doesn't, but the church was never supposed to be natural. The church is supernatural. The church is the demonstration of the wisdom of God on earth. It's the manifold wisdom of God that he wants to demonstrate through a miracle of unity and equality of elders working together. Let's move on actually with looking at this subject of the importance of equality. In many elder-led churches, the practice is to designate one as the lead or senior elder. The main thought behind this is that even among a group that seeks for consensus, and just for you to know, consensus means, well, literally in the Latin, consensus means to feel together. It's all feeling the same way about something. It's the full agreement of all parties. So consensus is not majority, it's everybody, okay? And so the argument here, the main thought behind this is that even among a group that seeks for consensus in decision-making, there will inevitably be occasional impasses which will require someone with recognized authority to determine a way forward. However, scripture says nothing of the role of a lead or senior elder, and our concern is that this practice diminishes true equality in the way elders function. Many in eldership have started with good intentions to function in plurality, only to devolve into an unbiblical structure reminiscent of the pastor and associate pastor model. Guys, I want you to understand something here. This tendency to fall back to that way of functioning is really, again, just to fall back to a worldly business model. Oftentimes, the church finds itself copying corporate America in its structure and style. And yet, again, there is something that God is so passionate to work through here. You know, I was... I was caught up with revelation of how eldership should function together before I had ever seen it work in practice. It's an interesting thing when you actually come to revelation in the word and realize I've never seen this, never seen this actually happen. 
And I had the privilege in the first eldership I was set into to work out the miracle of this. So I was set into a context which practically speaking had everything going against it working. I was set into an eldership with two men, both of which were old enough to be my father, one of which was actually my father-in-law, and the other was a very, very successful businessman. And we were kind of thrown into this team context together without any sense of who is the senior elder here. There was a sense in which my father-in-law technically was, because he was an elder before us, and he was looked to by the church in many ways in this capacity. There was a sense in which the other brother, who was older than both of us, and again, very successful on a business level, carried something of weight. And then there was me as the young guy in the mix, but the one that God had put the primary strategic dynamic in terms of direction and where we were going. It required a miracle of humility and yielding to one another as the Holy Spirit led us at different times. And so I had the privilege of being part of a situation where that which I'd seen biblically and never seen naturally, I was now seeing actually outwork to the glory of God. I wanna say again, it is God's desire to demonstrate his multifaceted wisdom through things that should not work naturally, but do work because of his Holy Spirit. And that's his intention for eldership. Some will argue that a true equality among elders is impractical and unworkable. Without a genuine and mutual submission to the Holy Spirit, we would agree. However, as is so often the case in the church, we believe that it is the intention of God to demonstrate something of his manifold wisdom through eldership functioning in equality and agreement. In real terms, this requires a level of humility and yielding as the Holy Spirit leads through one and then another as he sees fit. With regard to occasional impasses, as mentioned earlier, it would be the apostle's job to step in and bring help and direction at these points. Now, I just want to say something here, guys. There are times when we recognize that among an eldership, there can come a place where brothers are not in agreement with one another. They are seeing things from such different perspectives that it doesn't seem to be able to work together. What we don't do at that point is abandon the biblical structure of how we're built what happens at that point is we look to a functioning apostle and a functioning apostle will come into that context. He will hear all that have an opinion and view and feeling about things. He will hopefully share his wisdom into the mix as well. Very often that being all that's needed to bring it to consensus. But if there is still no consensus, there is consensus in the agreement of apostolic ministry at that point. And therefore, when that direction is brought, the men can come together and say, we're together, we're on board, we're going for it. And so gifting and responsibility. Though there should be governmental equality in an eldership, we should expect to see different degrees of gifting and responsibility in the elders. For example, all elders must be able to shepherd and teach the people of God. However, their level of gifting in these areas will vary and most will not be shepherds or teachers in the Ephesians 4 sense. In 1 Timothy 5.17, we read that the elders who direct the affairs of the church well are worthy of double honor, especially those whose work is preaching and teaching. This seems to imply that though there should be governmental equality in an eldership, there will be some elders who are particularly given to directing the affairs of the church. It certainly indicates that preaching and teaching will not be the primary work of all elders. Since double honor here refers to financial reward, 
It is probably reflecting the fact that while many, perhaps most elders, will fulfill their function in the church while retaining secular employment, some will be released and resourced to work for the church. Consequently, some will take more responsibility than others for the day-to-day -day administration, the shepherding care, the teaching and preaching, etc. Okay, is, is this clear then what we're saying here? We're saying that um, there will be elders who are particularly gifted and skilled to do certain things that will cause it to make sense to bring employment to that person to be able to concentrate on it full time. But it doesn't mean that they carry now more government in the church than the other elders. The government still equally rests on all of the elders together. It's just that some will carry more responsibility according to their gifting. Indeed, some elders may be or may become recognized as apostles, prophets, evangelists, shepherds or teachers and may combine their local eldership involvement with a wider Ephesians 4 ministry. For example, Peter was, of course, an apostle, but he was also an elder of the church in Jerusalem. We read that in 1 Peter 1, 1 and 5, 1. The authority of elders... Hebrews 13, 17 says this, Obey your leaders and submit to them, for they are keeping watch over your souls as those who will have to give an account. Let them do this with joy and not with groaning, for that would be of no advantage to you. Elders carry responsibility not just for the welfare and direction of the congregation as a whole, but for each individual. Jesus is concerned with every area of your life, not just your spiritual life, and so are elders. I'm going to stop here and say something. There has come somewhat within the church a kind of um, practical spiritual divide. It's almost like, you know, as, a, as an elder, as a church leader, we expect you to be watching over us in terms of spiritual matters. But don't be getting involved with our practical life. Our practical life is our own business. And so what you find is often in church life, a kind of Sunday type of Christianity with a mercy seat mentality, but actually leads into a week of walking away from the truths that we purport to believe on a Sunday morning. Many who have grown up in actually Christian homes know what it is to live a very different life from Monday to Saturday than they do on Sunday. And some of this is connected to the idea that leadership, that eldership is only really concentrating on the Sunday morning performance versus the actual care for people's lives. I want to say that it is a tremendously dangerous way of thinking. You know, I remember meeting with one particular guy and he would love to talk with me about spiritual matters. He always wanted to know what was happening in the spiritual realms in the city that we live in and what's happening on apostolic levels and what's going on here, there and everywhere. And whilst at the same time, his marriage was utterly falling apart and his life was a disastrous mess. And there'd be times when I'd meet with him and say, I, I don't want to talk about this passage in Revelation. I want to talk about the fact that your life is disastrous. I want to talk about the fact that everything is falling apart. I want to talk about your addictions and your issues because God cares about the whole of your life. You see, it's possible to actually have an appetite for spiritual things that doesn't actually equate to a life of obedience and following Christ. You know, King Saul was a man with a spiritual appetite. You put Saul with a bunch of prophets and Saul's prophesying. Saul was a king in the Old Testament that had an appetite for spiritual issues, spiritual dynamics, but it didn't convey into his real life. Next minute, he'll be trying to pin David to the wall with a spear. This was what Saul was like, this messed up, switching backwards and forwards individual. There's a lot of people in church life today that function that way. And you know, oftentimes it's actual relationship with eldership 
which can tremendously help sort this out in their life because it comes out of a Sunday morning experience and into the reality of 24 seven. They may at times bring very clear correction and direction to you. If you want to become part of a local church committed to New Testament practice, you must ask yourself whether you are willing for its elders to have this degree of involvement and authority in your life. To bring this into perspective, however, we must recognize that a father directs his toddler quite specifically at first, but expects to see in the child a growing ability to know and willingness to do the right thing. Similarly, a new Christian unfamiliar with the teachings of God's word may need specific direction in many areas. However, a godly leader's intention will be to bring that believer to a level of maturity in Christ where he is able to know and willingly to do what is right before God. Again, I can't read this and not be reminded of how filled with gratitude I still am today to have someone in my life in those early years that would correct me and challenge me. And yeah, at first very decisive because it was so necessary. And this man was able to help me think right. He was able to help me grow in my love for Jesus. He was able to um, impart to me wisdom that came from decades in his own life into but a few years of mine. What a privilege. And I'm telling you guys that when it eventually came to God moving me on to the next situation, it was actually the apostle coming in and actually speaking to the man who discipled me and saying, listen, I believe that John is supposed to be in another part of the country to be trained in the next phase of what God's doing in his life. And I remember going to Mike and saying, this is not right. This is not right. Tell him it's not right. And Mike said to me, he said, John, it is right. He said, that which I had, that which God has poured into me, I've poured into you. I've given you what I've got. Others now need to pour into you. Can I just say this? There was nothing in me that was reveling in the delight of getting out of the shackles of his leadership. It was like pulling off my arm and I wept when I left. I wept because I so valued godly eldership in my life. And even godly eldership that at the critical point was not so tied into his role in my life that he couldn't push me out into what God had for me next. That's admirable. It's beautiful. It's a wonderful thing. And it's a reflection of what eldership should be. A good parent doesn't discourage questions and you should feel free to share with your elders any concerns you may have regarding their direction or counsel. Also, just as good parents rejoice to see growing initiative, you do not need the permission of the elders before you make every decision or take a step in serving the Lord. They will, however, be interested to know what you are doing in order to offer you counsel, encouragement, etc. Guys, we're not talking about a relationship with eldership, which is a micromanaging of day-to-day -day type decisions. That's not what it's about. And sometimes it's become distorted and presented that way, but it's never really like that, should never be like that. But let me just say this, if you've understood the vital role of eldership in your lives, it will be a delight and a privilege and an encouragement to you to want to share particularly major decisions in your life with somebody who is responsible for the care of your soul. How many people have found themselves in situations where they're saying, what went wrong? Why did I do this? because they didn't take the time to draw the counsel from those who have a responsibility for caring for them. So what am I talking about here specifically? 
listen, if you're making a major career decision, that's something you might want to talk to an elder about. If you're looking at a geographical move, that's going to have a huge implication on your life. Talk it through with an elder. Draw from their counsel, their wisdom, their prayer for you within these things. Something like a, a major house purchase even. Mm -hmm. And again, I'm not talking about minor things like what you're going to have for breakfast in the morning. And, but if you're going to move from one house to another and your mortgage is going to be completely different than what it was before and the implications on your wife or your husband or your children, these are things to talk through with somebody who has actually got an objective ear to God, listening for you and communicating. So helpful, especially, I would say, in matters of the heart. So if you're dealing with courtship and marriage, I would say it's incredibly foolish not to draw leadership into your life at that point. Because how many of you know, when you're emotionally involved in the situation, you don't hear anything anymore. Your heart hears just what it wants to hear. And even when you do engage with those that are over you, you will tend to present what your heart wants rather than truly yield to the wisdom of God in a situation. Guys, I'm just saying, uh, true eldership wants to be involved with you on these things, not because they have an unhealthy interest in prying into the personal issues of your life. Couldn't be further from the truth. It's because they have to give an account to God for how they led you and cared for you. I hope you see how important this is. And so let's look at responding to authority. Romans 14, 12 tells us that each of us will give an account of himself to God. However, Hebrews 13, 17 shows that the church leaders will also give an account of how they took care of the flock in their charge. Elders, therefore, take their responsibility very seriously. Their aim is to please God and to be good stewards of those he has entrusted to their care. It is interesting to note from Hebrews 13, 17, that we are to obey our leaders so that their work will be with joy and not groaning. And that the latter would be of no advantage to us. Can I ask you this? Do you believe that the leading of your life is a joy? If I were to ask your leaders, is it a joy to lead this particular person? Would they say, oh yeah, it's a joy to lead them. Or could it be that if I ask them what it's like to lead you, it might evoke a groaning sound? Ugh. Ugh. Seriously, I at times encourage people to go to their leaders and say, may I ask you this question? Is leading me a joy? Or is it a duty and a chore? Is, is, it, is it something that evokes in you negativeness? It could be such an incredibly healthy thing for people to know because you know, brothers and sisters, you can make a change. You can actually determine in your heart, I'm actually going to make my leadership of me a joy to those who actually have the responsibility to carry it. You can make that change. Interestingly enough, it says it would be no advantage to you. Can I just say this, that the issue of benefit is all yours when it comes to leaders. Going to a leader and drawing counsel is not dissimilar than going to a doctor and getting a diagnosis. You go to a doctor and you have tests done and you have research done and you have a diagnosis. How many of you know if you don't do anything with that, the benefit is lost for you? It's not like the doctor goes away and becomes ill. You understand what I'm saying? It's not, it's not like it affects, in a sense, the doctor. It affects you if you don't follow through on the wisdom and the counsel that is given to you. 
you know, sometimes you can actually counsel people and consistently over time, they just don't do what you counsel them to do. I've known that happen. Even though they're agreeing with you when they're talking, I've sat with people and I said, well, you know, the word of God says this. Da, 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 da. So, absolutely. I know. You're right. You're right. Uh, yeah, you're right. Yep. I know what I'm supposed to I got it. I got it. And then they don't do it. It's of no advantage to them. The loss is theirs. Okay. Our willing submission is not for the purpose of exalting them, but rather for our own maturity and growth. As John Calvin points out when writing about this verse, if the salvation of our souls be precious to us, then we should consider with high regard those who watch out for it. Having looked at what the scriptures have to say about elders, let us now consider deacons. And we only have time to briefly look at deacons, so I'm just going to work through the major issues and points connected to deaconship. We do actually have a teaching online that you can access which further unpacks the whole role of deacons to the church. But looking first then at Philippians chapter 1, verse 1, Paul and Timothy, servants of Christ Jesus, to all the saints in Christ Jesus who are at Philippi with the overseers and deacons. Deacon comes from the Greek word diakonos, meaning servant, waiter, attendant, or minister. Interestingly enough, this word diakonos, dia means thoroughly, and konos means dust. And the idea is to thoroughly raise up dust by moving in a hurry as to minister. It's kind of like a cartoon. It's like the Tasmanian devil, isn't it? It's like it's moving so fast that dust is thrown up in terms of wanting to serve and minister in this way. Of course, every member of the church is to serve the whole in one way or another. But clearly the term deacon is reserved in scripture only for some. Although not specifically named as such, many consider Stephen and the other men chosen in Acts 6 to be the first deacons. This is because they were appointed to relieve the apostles of the responsibility to wait on uh, diaconio tables, thereby enabling the apostles to give their attention to prayer and the ministry of the word. Qualifications for deacons. These seven men were chosen on the basis of being full of the spirit and of wisdom. However, when considering the qualification for deacons, attention is usually given to 1 Timothy 3 verses 8 to 13. The requirements there are surprisingly similar to those for elders and can again be summarized as character, capability and confirmation. However, it is important to note that the ability to teach and defend the faith is not a requirement and unlike elders, their function in the church is not governmental. So basically, guys, if you were to read through this qualifications, you would say, okay, that reads just like an elder, really, you know, except for this issue of the ability to teach and defend doctrine. And that's because the role of deacons is not a governmental role within the church. It's a purely servant based role in the church. Again, there are churches that are structured in such a way that the governing authoritative group in the church is the diaconate. These deacons that actually control, the church, it's a complete misuse of the word. There's no biblical basis for that. And it's incredibly unhelpful in the functioning life of the leadership. Okay, so the appointment of deacons. In Acts 6, the deaconing role emerged when a practical need was causing problems in the church and threatening to take the leaders away from their primary responsibilities. We might therefore conclude that deacons are not merely appointed for the sake of having them. In other words, you don't just put in deacons just because, well, we should have them because the New Testament church has them. But they're there to meet particular needs that arise from time to time. Secondly, from Acts 6, we might conclude that people are appointed as deacons when their ability to serve stands out beyond the normal. 
The deaconing role has sometimes been thought of as a less spiritual function, one that can be left to more practical types. This is certainly not the basis on which the seven were chosen. Indeed, it requires servants who are empowered by the Holy Spirit to produce the sort of fruit subsequently seen in that instance. In Acts 6, verse 7, we read, And the word of God continued to increase, and the number of the disciples multiplied greatly in Jerusalem, and a great many of the priests became obedient to the faith. Therefore, as with elders, we must first look for the anointing of the Holy Spirit when appointing deacons. This must be seen and confirmed by the congregation who must also be aware that the candidates fulfill the requirements set out in 1 Timothy 3. The elders will then pray for them and lay hands on them as the apostles did with the seven. So finally, let's look at responsibilities of deacons. Deacons operate on behalf of the elders and are accountable to them. Their responsibilities in the church are not general, but are limited to their designated area of service, which may be administrative, like organizing aspects of the life and the ministry of church, handling the finances, etc., or more shepherding, like dealing with specific needs, working with home groups, and children's work, etc. Though they do not carry governmental authority, their responsibilities will no doubt include administering and directing others in areas of service. Because they are known to be acting on behalf of the elders and because they are respected for who they are and what they do, they will receive the willing cooperation of those working with them. A nurtured church. Jesus is referred to in 1 Peter 2, 25 as the shepherd and overseer of our souls. He has fully provided for the maturing and equipping of his church by giving his word, his spirit, and the Ephesians 4 ministries. However, he did not stop there. He has brought an intimate care to each local congregation by establishing elders and deacons to lead and serve his people on a daily basis. Be thankful for them. Be determined to make their work as easy as possible. They need your love, help, and prayerful support. Guys, this is not just a nice closing statement. Many churches are filled with members that whine, complain, criticize, and fail to love and pray for their leaders. And frankly, they end up with the leaders they deserve. That's what you end up with. See, because the scripture is clear that we should be praying for our leaders. We should be making their lives joyful, not painful. I believe that in many church situations, what's needed more than anything else is for the people to begin to earnestly pray for those who lead them. I want to say in closing that I've had the privilege of just serving with men of real excellence in eldership. I want to commend the elders of the churches that I'm involved with to you, to those who are involved in our churches. Um, I have found them to be consistently men who will put the care of the flock above and beyond their own desires and their own ambitions. I've seen them time and time again lay down their lives in the most inconvenience of times to serve and love the people of God. I've seen them handle correction in their own lives. I've seen them humbly um, confess to the church and to others. I've seen them outwork brotherhood and relationship in astounding ways, wonderful ways. And so it is a privilege to be able to commend them to you, those that care for you. I also want to say that you have been a people that have been a joy to lead. You have been a people that have not been full of whining and complaining. And so I also want to commend you in your relationship 
with those leaders that have been caring for you. So that ends this session. In the next session, we're going to look at fellowship and responsibility. We're going to look at what it is to outwork this relationship with one another on the ground. And I look forward to getting into the next session with you.